Okay. Um, so I want to welcome everyone to uh, this month's meeting of the Houston Functional Programming User Group. Um, and uh, today we have a um, talk on Gleam, an uh, introduction to the language and its infrastructure. And I will just turn it over to Rule to introduce yourself and take it away. So um, everybody, welcome Rule. Hello, thank you everyone for receiving me at, the, at this meetup group. Uh, I will start sharing my presentation and let me see, okay. Um, is it possible for me to share just one screen? Uh, okay, it seems that I cannot. Okay, uh, I guess we will have to do it like this. <laughs> uh, don't mind my notes. <laughs> Uh, or I might try to do it without notes. Okay. So, hello everyone. Thank you so much for receiving me. My name is Raul Chosa. I am a computer engineer and Elixir programmer. And I'm talking to you all the way from the city of Tijuana, Mexico, which is uh, 1,500 miles from Houston, more or less. Uh, Tijuana is just right at the corner of, at one of the corners of Mexico, uh, at the top west. Uh, in one of these pictures, you can actually see one of the actual corners, <laughs> right there is the border with the United States. And yeah, I mean, it's a city, it's growing, and it's also uh, important detail. It's home of the original Caesar salad. So if you are around San Diego or Tijuana, come and try the Caesar salad. I am currently working at Erlang Solutions and I am part of the Americas office. Uh, we are the Jaguars, that's our uh, office mascot. And at Erlang Solutions, I'm considered a senior Elixir developer. So it's been quite fun having, having the opportunity to learn Erlang, Elixir, and actually work in those technologies as my day-to-day -day driver. And I'm here to tell you about Gleam. This will be an introduction to the language and the platform. And, um, okay, I might want to do this with notes because <laughs> I have a couple of things that I want to say. Uh, so, although I love Elixir as my language of choice for my day-to-day -day job, I have become quite an enthusiast of the Glee programming language. And the way I will describe it is that Gleam is a fun and simple language for building systems. Uh, this is a very generic description, but we will get into more details. So the first thing is that Gleam is fun. Here you can see one of the simplest Gleam programs that I could fit into one slide. Basically at the top, we do have our imports for the libraries or, or for the standard library. Then in the middle, we have a module level uh, constant, which is just an array with four elements inside of it. And then uh, there's uh, at the bottom, a function called main. Main is usually the starting point of all Gleam programs. And inside of this function, basically what I want to do is I want to shuffle the list and retrieve one element from the list randomly. So I do exactly that with the function list shuffle. I shuffle the persons, and then I grab the first person in the list. So when I try to build and compile this program, the first thing that happens is that Gleam says, hey, this is an inexhaustive pattern. Uh, this assignment uh, does not match all possible values. Basically, the compiler is saying, hey, are you sure this list will not be empty? Maybe it, have, it will have more than one, more, more than one element. Uh, but we do have more information than the compiler. We know that the constant above contains four elements, so we can just make that assertion and tell the compiler to trust us. Uh, with this, you can already probably see that Gleam uh, type system is quite simple. 
it can infer a lot when given the right types, but it doesn't everything by itself. Uh, Gleam inherits the wisdom of the SML family of languages, and you can think of it as a less powerful version of F Sharp, OCaml, Haskell, Foley. Uh, but it doesn't try to be fancy about the types or the abstractions it uses. Uh, regarding the types, it is possible for us to declare custom types that have a single constructor, like with the coordinate type above. But also, we can create types that have multiple constructors, like, for example, this piece type above. Um, usually, this might be called some type in some languages. Uh, and for example, here, uh, I'm trying to describe my favorite feature, which is like, uh, pattern matching. So for example, I have the add function in which I'm passing two coordinate types, and then I'm trying to decompose those coordinates into the inner values. And then I'm just trying to sum them up to return a single coordinate. Uh, pattern matching will allow us will always allow us to be very precise with about what we want to do with the program. And for example, here I have another function that works on coordinates. I want to determine if the coordinate is absolute. Uh, a really cool thing about pattern matching is that we cannot only match the shape of the constructor. We can also evaluate uh, the values inside of the constructor. And these operations are guaranteed to be very efficient by the Erlang virtual machine itself. Uh, finally, uh, we can also pattern match against some types. So for example, here I'm passing a piece, and then I can match on any one of the constructors to do any operation. And claim is also simple. So for example, with these lights, you have probably already seen about 70% of what conforms core Gleam. But for me, the simplicity in Gleam doesn't come from the syntax itself, but in how you structure the system. Giving shape to a project in Gleam is usually not an issue because everything is just modules and functions. And the type system comes in handy for data abstraction. And the way I feel about Gleam is that it is like playing with big and chunky Duplo blocks. Uh, and you know, Duplo, block, Duplo blocks will never break. Uh, so here I put some articles and essays that I think better explain these benefits. So the first one is uh, from Kayla. Uh, she uh, has a blog where she has this post called All You Need Is Data and Functions. Uh, the other one is the guide from uh, the Elm language where they talk about modules and how to grow modules. And I feel like this is very, a very interesting approach to programming, but also I feel like this, uh, this reasoning applies very well to Glean projects. And finally, I have the Erlang Rational by Robert Birding. Uh, they, he has like a small section where he talks about the modules code and code loading for Erlang. But uh, I, I feel like this is also interesting because uh, at the end of the day, Gleam will compile to Erlang. So well, you, you can see where things come from in Gleam sometimes. And finally, if you want to learn more about the syntax, you can go to this webpage, tour.gleam.run. And this is an interactive tutorial that will explain the core basics of Gleam. And you can learn Gleam in a couple of hours. It's a very simple language. So now it's demo time. So let me show a small demo. And here uh, I have a little game I made. Uh, I, I love board games, and one of the board games uh, I really like is called Battleline from Rainer Nietzsche. Uh, basically, uh, the game is about like playing cards on a board and playing uh, on different line battles for points. So, for example, uh, the player two will start. The player two will play four cards, however they want, and then the player one. Uh, We'll also play. Um, and the player one will also play. And then I can just withdraw. 
And if I refresh this, for example, I am right now on here, brief rounds. You can see that uh, the state uh, is shared between the sessions. So for example, I can uh, move things on one screen, and but I can also interact on the other. Uh, this is back. This is because this application, at the end of the day, is just using a server, and the server uh, triggers the client for a WebSocket connection. And now we have different clients talking with web WebSockets between one another. This is more or less the demo. Let me return to the presentation. So at the end of the day, Claim loves Erlang. And the demo we just saw was compiled to Erlang and ran on the Erlang virtual machine. The Erlang virtual machine is effectively over here, my server. And as a small intro to Erlang, if you don't know it, uh, is that Erlang is a programming language used to build massive scalable systems. Uh, it's been used in telecoms, banking, e-commerce for decades now. And it is very vital but tested for any kind of system that needs a high level of concurrency. And while Erlang might be defined as a functional programming language, it will be more correct to say that it is a concurrent language. As Joe Armstrong, another creator of the language, put it, Erlang's unit of computation is a process. And a process in Erlang has its own space and memory and also a shared time. Uh, the memory between processes is not shared. And the Erlang virtual machine guarantees that each process takes their fair amount of compute time in the virtual machine. This means that a heavy process will never slow down the other processes in the virtual machine, but also that the sure nothing property let us have highly concurrent systems. This is because any task we spawn with the different processes are repeatable if they all just have the same copy of the data. They are not sharing anything. Uh, and if you'd like to check more about the inner workings of Erlang, I highly recommend the Sasha Jurek talk, The Soul of Erlang and Elixir. It's a really, really great talk that talks about the inner workings. And to show these capabilities, let me return to our demo. And uh, now, instead of like playing a game manually, what I will try to do is I'm just going to spawn a couple hundred processes. So all of these are processes, and they are all playing the games between each other. So for example, if I join a game, I can see the progress of that game and how the different machines are playing between each other. Basically, what happens is that I have a process that is a session. That is where I store the game state of the game. And then I have other two processes, and these are computer players. And basically, they all just do random moves in the game. But with very simple code, I have like both a session going and two players, two computer players playing the game between each other. Uh, we can see that we already finished all the games. And uh, you can see that uh, the Erlang virtual machine, well, you can maybe not see it, but the Erlang virtual machine didn't like break a sweat with this. Uh, usually, the, the bottleneck right here is usually the browser because I'm rendering too much. But uh, the Erlang virtual machine will behave as if nothing happened. And I want to explain a little bit of the architecture behind of this. So you can see a little bit of uh, Glee code. So for example, over here, I do have uh, the Glee module in charge for uh, the game. and this module, it's only defining and declaring I'm, the game. I'm sorry, Rural. Uh, is there any way for you to make it a little bit bigger? It's pretty small on our screens. Yes. The, the code, the we can see the cards. Awesome. Thank you. OK. Yeah. So uh, yeah, this is, this is all just the game logic. And basically, it's just like a more or less 600 lines of code of just the game and the rules and how to encode the games with types and rules. Uh, let me show something maybe simple. For example, we have a card type somewhere here. Here we have the card type. The card type is defined only by a rank, which is just an integer and a suite. 
And the suite is just defined by this sum type, which is can be a spade, card, diamond, or club. And with this, for example, if I want to shuffle my cards, I think I have a function right here called, I just create a new deck. I call this shuffle. And then basically uh, with a flat map and a map, I can just create all permutations of the possible cards that should be available. And then the function shuffle will just shuffle everything. So we can have like a shuffle deck. Uh, also like, for example, drawing a card involves a couple of actions, which is to check uh, the hand of the player. And once we have the hand of the player, what I will try to do is to draw a card from the deck. This is basically a pop operation on the list. And then I try to add this card to the hand just to check if the hand is not already full. And then after that, I just modify the main uh, board state with the new deck and the new hands of the different players. And that's basically it. So this is more or less what Gleam looks like, at least for game logic. Uh, then, for example, I do have a session. And a session is basically the module that will help me to launch all this logic inside of a process and store the state inside of this process. Uh, this process, uh, it's basically an actor abstraction from the actor model of computation. Uh, processes are, you can see processes in the run more like tasks, but you can also, with a couple of abstract abstractions, elevate them with different, uh, different concepts. In this case, uh, this is the concept of an actor. Uh, and here, basically, this actor is just in charge of storing the state and uh, applying operations on the state. So this is basically the memory I'm using for that game. And uh, another useful module, for example, let, let's check the view of how we draw the HTML into the page. The view, it's uh, interesting because it's just like a way of taking in the types that we already know. For example, we can take the card and we can draw the card on the page. So for example, let me see if I have a card function somewhere here. Um, for example, here I'm drawing the front of the card. So all I need to do is I can pass my card type and then I start composing the HTML right in Gleam. So this is very similar to how maybe all maps compose their HTML. I can just basically do the same with Gleam and generate the text that is necessary. Now, uh, let's go back to the presentation. And th let's go step by step into more or less what happened in this demo. So here's more or less uh, kind of like a diagram of the different actions. And here, what I'm trying to describe is, for example, I have a client. And then the client makes a post to, uh, to my server. And this post will create a new session. And this session will be, uh, it will be registered on this session registry, which is basically just an index of all the sessions that I have available, and will create zero, one, or two computer players along with it. Then this session, will uh, we will grab the game state of this session and just pass it to the view function that generates my HTML. And I will just uh, render or redirect this uh, HTML body into a new web page. So for the time being, everything is just a static page. Uh, then after the page receives a response, the page will try to upgrade the connection to a web socket. And if it's successful, the web socket will basically connect to the session. So they will know each other and say, OK, I can respond to you to this session. And the socket will also be registered on a socket registry. Again, an index of all the different clients that are connected to a single session. So we can connect various clients to the same session, and they are connected via WebSockets. And what happens is if one of the client sessions sends a command, like play a card, uh, the socket will try to update the state and the session. The session will return the state. And if everything is successful, it will tell the socket registry, hey, this is the new state of the game. Uh, go and send the HTML to all the other clients connected to the session. 
more or less, this is uh, the general architecture of the game. And you can see like all of these circles, you can think of them, each one of them is a single process that is in charge of a single thing in the system. So, okay, let's show the demo one more time, but uh, no, actually I'm finished. <laughs> this, is not, this is not part of it. Oh, oh, right, I forgot. Yes, let's show the demo one more time, but uh, this diagram was static. Let's show a, di a live diagram. Uh, the airline virtual machine has something very cool called uh, the Observer. Observer is an application that we can use to more or less debug and evaluate what's happening in the virtual machine. And the thing I'm interested in here is this, the applications. The applications basically is a tree of all the process that are being managed on the airline virtual machine. The Erlang virtual machine has this idea of a tree of processes and how uh, supervisors control child processes and how other child processes might have might be supervising other processes. So that's how the tree is formed. So let's try to do again like a hundred. No, let just to make it visually pleasing. Let's try to make like a 10, 10 process session and see what happens. You can see that. The TLS connection supervisor just found, uh, I guess, 10 processes, maybe more. <laughs> and these processes in place have other processes. My theory is that these processes are the computer players, but I'm not sure. And each one of these is a session. Because I have not named, it, named them, uh, I'm not entirely sure about this, but we can be sure that my action triggered the process tree somehow. And with good naming and good organization, we can use this tool and the actual command tool from Erlang to debug the different systems in, in, in the Erlang virtual machine. Uh, so with that done, let's go to the next part of the presentation. Uh, the other part is that Gleam loves JavaScript. And uh, by the way, I had a quick question. So, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, so when you have all those uh, games playing at the same time, does each one of those have a socket to an individual session or does the view stay? I mean, is it is it more like, I don't know, I'm thinking like the LM architecture where everything goes through a single buffer and then the buffer, you know, pushes messages to to individual, you know, components of state. Yeah, right. So for expediency purposes, uh, uh, to to finish the demo, uh, I didn't took the time to actually model this the right way. Oh, that's fine. I was all, curious. What what what, all, what would be the, renders, the right way? <laughs> I mean, all of these renders are just like uh, uh, how they are called uh, iframe windows, iframes. Yeah, yeah, iframes. That was like the easy <clears throat> solution, but like doing it the proper way will be doing like with the Elm. Mm -hmm. uh, way style of doing it, where I will go to my registry, get all the sessions, and try to render in a single in a single render all the sessions in like in a single request, and then use WebSockets to start like uh, sending messages of when the state changes, or maybe do uh, if I don't want to waste too much networking, maybe do like uh, try to uh, try the server for new information. If but that you, makes you sense. You could potentially have like one web socket per component, right? Like where you have yes. So so it's not like a so so typically like you know when I think of the Elm architecture, you have like a single, you know, uh, circular buffer or something like that 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 takes the messages and 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 handles them in order. Uh, okay, no, I was curious. Thanks, appreciate it. Yeah, but uh, I mean, uh, what we can be sure is that each one of these games is a web socket connection happening. That that's for sure. So we have like a hundred clients connected at the same time. That's when I was saying that usually the web browser is a is a bottleneck uh, because uh, a single web browser might like start start to stall when so many web socket connections are open at the same time and so much information is happening and so much is rendering, uh, which is like a performance issue I didn't concern myself with because this was a demo and I wanted to finish it. <laughs> But yeah, the, 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 there will be a better way of doing this, definitely. Um, also, um, Ryan had a question. Uh, Ryan, do you want to ask oh, a yeah. question? Oh, yeah. Um, 
I kind of, <laughs> I've almost forgotten the context now, but I, you mentioned something about sessions and I was just curious if you kind of rolled your own session logic or if you use like an existing like Gleam library or something. Um, yeah, my, my session lo logic is basically just a uh, Gleam actor that I'm spawning every time a new session is created. Gotcha. And it's custom made. Cool, cool. Um, I, I did, I did try to make kind of like a uh, to to have a more functional session working on, but at the end of the day, for practical purposes, I decided to do the simplest thing. Yeah, that yeah, makes sense. I was just wondering, uh, like, do you think? Uh... I mean, obviously, I know this is a demo, but if it, if it weren't a demo, do you think you would still kind of use like the base gleam kind of like, uh, you know, like OTP kind of stuff, or would you try to reach for some other solution, or or can you just keep it simple because it's like mm -hmm. you can just you know do the Erlangy type stuff too, or you know, does that make sense? Yeah. So like, if I were to reveal this. Uh, I will probably still use an actor, a Gleam actor, because that's the right abstraction and it doesn't take, like, it's just a process. It doesn't, it's not a big performance concern for me. Uh, so yeah, I think it's just the right abstraction. If I were to try to do myself one, I will probably end up with a very similar solution, or I will just probably end up using uh, Erlang or Elixir processes or gen servers, uh, which basically will do almost the same. But I think I will end up using uh, uh, Gleam actors just because they are already available. Cool, thanks. So uh, to continue the presentation, uh, the, the other thing is that Gleam loves JavaScript. Uh, uh, oh yeah, and let's look at the JavaScript part of this project because there must be some JavaScript somewhere. And all the JavaScript in this project are these 18 lines of code. And definitely I'm committing uh, harsh crimes against web development here. Basically all I'm doing is just creating a new WebSocket session. And then when the WebSocket receives a message, basically, I grab all the body of the response that I get. I extract the HTML and I just copy it to the body.inner.html, which is, I understand, not the best, but it works. <laughs> so definitely this can be greatly improved, which is what I want to talk about right now. <laughs> so for example, uh, it is a shame that I am not really using uh, JavaScript builds, uh, Gleam to JavaScript builds to make the front end actually interactive. So for example, one of the things that doesn't work through WebSockets is submissions, because even if I can send like uh, pixel perfect positions of each one of my cards to make an animation uh, through WebSockets, maybe that's not ideal. Uh, regarding the server processing, but also like the network process, the, the, the network cost that, that will involve. Uh, so let's explore this dot for a bit. Uh, one of the recurring topics of the late Joe Armstrong, uh, which is Erlang Code Creator, had to do with the all in one application. An all in one application will be resilient even if changes are introduced. Uh, an all-in-one application will be a program that can forever live because the program and data could not be separated. Uh, so he had this theory that usually systems start to fall off in pieces because we want to separate things into, okay, this, uh, this the data comes goes here and the server goes this in this other place and they will just, just communicate between each other and everything will be fine. Well, the theory of John Armstrong is that that's how the system starts to fail. Because if data and the program are not together, well, what, what's the purpose of this? You can see more of these explorations in the talks of Intergrangling, the Deadly Wiki, and The Mess We're In by John Armstrong. You can search them on YouTube. And they are great talks. They, they go to places. Uh, and 
we can also draw parallels with the explorations of Recabellum and the Windu. They are both a couple that decided to use sailing as their menu as the medium for their creative projects. Uh, these projects will encompass photography, design, games, and programming. And they figured out that the systems they used to use on a day to day basis will break when in the middle of the ocean. The internet will fail, their devices will rot, the battery will drain. So how will they solve all these issues? Well, thankfully, they thought all about it in their site and blog, uh, 100rabbits.co, and specifically the, the part about computing and sustainability. It's an amazing talk. So they talk about resilience in the ocean, but also resilience in their own devices and how they had to build basically their own virtual machine, their own programming language, and their own technology and devices to make it actually resilient when they were in different conditions. So uh, going back to Erlang and the topic about uh, data and compute power, uh, moving computation is not necessarily alien to the Erlang virtual machine. It's a lot of what already happens in it. Uh, but when Joe was talking about, oh, will systems will fall if the data and the compute power are not in the same place, uh, I don't think he was necessarily saying that you should not move the computation around. Uh, just that the data and computation was intertwined. So we need to always make wide decisions. Uh, for example, I could set my server to render HTML, but at the same time, I could also delegate this responsibility to my web browser with a client application. And at the end of the day, I have to decide where is the trade-off that I am trying to decide on. Uh, so in, at, the, at the end of the day, it's all trade-offs. It's trade-offs like it, against complexity, maintainability, performance, network, power consumption, and trying to go back to clean. Uh, we can all compile your files to JavaScript, but how do we keep the main model resilient? Uh, there are various approaches to do this. And thankfully, uh, a member of the community, a core uh, Gleam member, actually, uh, Haley Thompson, uh, has a solution in the form of the Lustre framework. So she designed Lustre around flexibility. Uh, Lustre will let you to do web components that leave 100% of the front end, 100% of the back end, or maybe somewhere in the middle. Uh, sadly, I will need to leave you with no demo for this one. But if you are interested, check out the library at lustre.build. And when I started this presentation, I said that Gleam is a language for building systems. And to be very clear, I didn't meant only web systems. We can use uh, the different backends and targets for Erlang and JavaScript to build systems on all the platforms where these languages are supported. So for example, here I'm showing a small diagram of how Gleam can compile to Erlang or JavaScript. So we have uh, in Erlang, for example, we can use the Erlang virtual machine, usually the most common uh, use case for Erlang. <laughs> but there are also other virtual machines. There's the Atom virtual machine, which is a virtual machine designed for low spec processors and microcontrollers. And there's also, for example, NERVs, which is basically any kind of microcontroller where that can support Linux. Uh, NERVs is a tool that lets you build the firmware into that device. And that lets you have uh, Linux, lets you have drivers, lets you have the whole Erlang and Elixir platform in a single device, which is a very powerful feature of NERVs. Or there's also the GRISP microcontroller. And the GRISP microcontroller is super interesting because it builds the Erlang virtual machine directly on the metal. And again, we have like, at the end of the day, if we uh, compile Clean to Erlang, we can use Erlang to build uh, uh, under these platforms. In a similar way, we can do the same with JavaScript. Normally, I have been using it on the web browser. But we can also use it on Node, Deno, Bond, and other platforms that do support JavaScript. And also other domains. For example, I know that some uh, that, uh, that there's some tooling to build JavaScript right into Raspberry Pi, 
or also to build like small uh, terminal applications. So finally, this is the end of the presentation. I just wanted to uh, give credit where credit is due. All the graphic designs for the Americas office is done by Carlo Hilmar. You can follow him on substack.com at Visual Partner. He has some interesting articles about how to think in terms of pictures and drawings. So uh, uh, yes, I just wanted to credit him for the pictures. Uh, also, I wanted to promote that Codebeam Light New York City and Codebeam America will be happening. In the case of Codebeam New York, it will happen. It will be happening on November. It will be like a one-day uh, conference where you can meet like incredible people. And the same for Codebeam America in San Francisco happening on March. Uh, for Codebeam America, I'm part of the committee, so I, I can guarantee that we will have very interesting personalities on that conference. And Finn, that's the end. So thank you so much for listening to me. And I hope this presentation was fruitful for everyone. All right. Thank you so much. Um, this was great. This was su super, super interesting. Um, so I will open it up. I've, I've got questions, but I want to open it up to other people first. Mm -hmm. So what are your questions or comments? I yes. sort of oh, I dropped sorry. one in Go the ahead. chat. I didn't realize that you were about to end. Uh, but oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> oh no, that's uh, sorry. I was. Uh, you just mentioned uh, nerves, and I was wondering if you had done any projects with Gleam and nerves, or I was sort of. I've never really been able to. I haven't tried super hard, but mixing Elixir with Gleam seems to be a little trickier than Erlang and Gleam just because of like, yes. I don't know, like some meta programming or mix, like the mix tool doesn't seem to really know about Gleam very well. I was just wondering, I don't know if that's something that people are working on or like, have you, have you ever had uh, like a good experience mixing Gleam and like hardcore Elixir stuff that uses a lot of meta programming or really integrated with mix and stuff like that? Yes, so uh, I have tried in the past to mix uh, an Elixir project that envelopes a Gleam project. And basically, the Gleam project will live as a library in Higgs. And then I will just have like an Elixir project that will be in charge of all the supervision tree. But also, uh, I wanted to use Elixir because I was using Scenic. Scenic is kind of like a graphics library. Uh, made by one of the uh, ex Xbox team. Uh, I don't recall his name right now, but very famous person. And he he made the Scenic library to be able to render static uh, static graphics. Let's say it uh, within Elixir. But I don't have like access to all the macros from Gleam. So what I did was like, okay, let's have this Elixir project. Let's wrap up my library, which has all the game logic. And then I could render like a small chess game inside of Scenic. That worked okay, but I had I I really struggled a lot configuring the Elixir project, as you mentioned. What has been working way better for me is to actually put Elixir files inside of my Gleam project, which is not necessarily the same because uh, because you don't have the mix tool, so it's. Uh, you, you don't have like all the niceties of a mixed project. So you have to trust that, okay, this is an Elixir file. And basically all I do is just modules and functions in Elixir. And then I use Gleam FFI to uh, communicate to Elixir. And I have done this successfully for, for example, my register library, which is somewhere here. Let, let me find it to see if I can show it. Uh, Visual Studio, where is it? Perfect. Okay. Let me share my screen very quickly. So here, for example, I have the cheap library. This is just a register library I built for all my games. <laughs> and what I can do is I can benchmark the different uh, the, the registry to see if it's performant or not. And basically what I do is I run a command called uh, clean run 
Uh, I think it was benchmark. Yes. Uh, error module does not exist. Uh, oh, that's because I'm not in the in the right project. So, for example, when I try to run the benchmark, I'm running the different benchmarks for the chip.find function. And basically what is happening here is that I am calling this benchmark elixir file. Let me show the screen. Uh, this is just a chip.benchmark performance, and this is elixir code. Uh, I use the benchy library because it's the easiest library I know how to use to get benchmarks out of the beam. And uh, basically, this is all just a single function called run, run scenario. And uh, the only thing I'm doing in Gleam is I also have a benchmark.gleam file. And I am using the FFI to say, hey, there exists a module in Elixir called performance.run, uh, create a binding to Gleam, and just run the different benchmarks I want to run. And with this, I was able to get like different benchmarks and document them as part of the project. Yeah, that's cool. Do you, do you mind so, if I just ask one follow up? So, like, if uh, I know you are, you know, Elixir sort of by day programmer, so would you ever consider, like, all right, I've got a Phoenix app, maybe it's using Live View or something. And instead of having my like, you know, uh, card game and card game web, what if I just had my card game like, and all the context and stuff, but just wrote all the business logic in Gleam or something like that? Would you ever consider that, or is that something that's like it's not not ready yet, or or would it be something? Is I could imagine like, you know, you could do like nice domain modeling in Gleam, but you can still have the Elixir and Phoenix for like handling the live view and the controllers and all that but is that something that would be worth pursuing or you think it has a cool application or just any thoughts about it yeah definitely so this is actually what i did for a previous presentation uh let me find it uh here So th this is a, a, a previous presentation I did for Code Beam America, where I was basically encoding a chess game in Gleam. And then from the library, it, the, uh, app, the, the whole uh, chess logic will exist as just Gleam. But then again, I, I was trying to use Scenic for the UI and Scenic required Elixir. So I used an Elixir project because I could not figure out how to call the macros from Gleam at the time. Oh, and also at the time, uh, it was not possible to compile Elixir programs from Gleam. So I decided to use a, an Elixir project that wraps up Gleam. But yeah, I mean, this is totally feasible. But again, the, the, difficulty, the difficulties I had with this was like getting the mix tool to understand Gleam. That was uh, quite a struggle. But at the end, it worked once you have it like going. Um, and also, like you asked for hardware, I think this is something I have been trying to do. Well, not not very hard, but I do actually have the different devices over here. I have used Nerves on the past with Elixir only, but the one I really wanted to use, uh, my my company developed this uh, small chip, which is like an SM uh, SMT thirty two device and. Uh, and what they were trying to do is they were trying to run Atom VM on it, on it. And my theory was like, okay, if Blink compels to core Erlang, I can just take those Erlang files, put it in this chip, and make, make, it, make it just go. But I failed at that because I didn't knew the Atom VM tool well enough. But I'm pretty sure it's possible. I just haven't had the time to actually try it out again. But I would really love to have like a Gleam uh, microcontroller library because I, I I can see like maybe types will blend very well with with uh, the different sheets from the different components and microcontrollers, but I still have to test that theory. Thanks. So um, 
Alex had a question um, in, in the chat. And Alex, if you want to chime in, you can. I, I think his question, so he's asking um, uh, what it means uh, by Gleam compiling to Erlang or JS. I, I think what he's asking is, is um, is it uh, compiling straight to the beam or is it transpiling to Erlang slash? It is transpiling to Erlang and it's also transpiling to JavaScript. Uh, I think there have been some discussions in the Gleam Discord about having Gleam to be capable of compiling to some native format for doing graphics and other kinds of applications, but that's still not uh, very well developed. It's just in discussion form, as far as I know it. But yeah, if for the time being, it's, it's a transpiler to Erlang and JavaScript. Other questions? I, I guess I was going to ask, Are you? do you get to do a lot of Gleam programming by day? Or are you kind of focusing on? Erlang, are there a lot of projects out there that call for for Gleam? I'm just kind of curious. But uh, how... I have tried to introduce it at work, uh, not successfully. No, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I just got like I think I had like a small good application for Gleam in the form of a parser, but uh, yeah, I I didn't have the chance to do that. Uh, so I do it. I do Gleam as a hobby right now. Uh, as I said in the presentation, I really love board games. That's right there, my board game collection. Uh, but the problem is that I cannot synchronize with my friends to play them. So a great deal about exploring Gleam is that I want to build my own like game library so we can play on the web. But yeah, again, it's extra time that probably I don't have <laughs> right now. Yeah, it's, it sounds like, I mean, with the kind of the, the Beam backend, it would be really cool to get a, a nice game engine in it. That would be... A very cool application. Yeah, because then uh, sessions are trivial to store. And mm -hmm. one of the superpowers of the Beam is uh, the Erlang OTP library comes with their own kind of like databases. They're in memory and also on these databases. And that's like a superpower just having it right there without having to configure my database, which I mean, I do love SQL and relational databases, but Having it available on the virtual machine is also very powerful. Ooh, thanks, really nice. Actually, that, that's probably one of my next projects, a small uh, database, database API for, for Gleam that uses CTS as, a, as the backend. Cool. All right. Um, I am going to ask for any last questions while we're recording. And then I will stop the recording and then we can ask other questions that we've been holding off on. Anything else right now? Okay. Um, all right, I am going to try to figure out how to stop the recording. There it is. <laughs>